I'm here with James Keith Phillips. Today is April 5th, 2014. My name is Susan Soto, and we're going to be interviewing James, who was born on September 15th, 1954, and we're on the Shinnecock Indian Reservation in New York State. James, tell me where you came from. Southampton, New York, Shinnecock Indian Reservation. And were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. And where were you living at the time when you enlisted? On the Shinnecock Indian Reservation. And why did you join? Because I, I knew there was something else. I wanted to go see the world and I wanted to travel. And I had grown up reading a lot of science fiction, Jules Verne and Edgar Rice Barrows, so I wanted to go on a big ship across the ocean, having grown up on the ocean. And do you recall your first days in the service? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, we get there very dark, zero dark 30, and shuttled off the bus into the barracks, which was the old part of the Great Lakes boot camp at that point and it was just very confusing they got us off the bus and the next morning they woke us up took us to get our hair cut and gave us our uniforms and our ditty bags and uh, then we started then we moved uh, from the old camp to the new barracks on the other side of uh, the Great Lakes boot camp and what did it feel like it felt great it was fun I thought it was all fun Tell me about your boot camp training experiences. Um, they were basically the same boot camp. You went and got up every morning and you learned, went to classes in the Navy, uh, ships and knots, a ship identification, uh, basic seamanship, mostly basic seamanship. The highlight was the gas chamber where you went and took your gas mask and then you took them off and choked up. And the other one was the obstacle course. And I remember going on perimeter uh, patrol. And per, you could just patrol the perimeter in these big Navy foul weather coats all night long. A little four or five hours. I think it was four hour shifts. And do you remember any of your instructors? My uh, company commander was William Becker, who was a master chief. A lot of boys like that. Well, and I found out later that a lot of the master chiefs had voices like that because they had been deck men. Deck sailors in the uh, World War II and the Korean War, so they were used to yelling, so they had those voices. And Commander Becker, Chief Becker, had about, I don't know, lots and lots. He was retiring. So he had, like, was the first time I ever saw a Master Chief with all the red stripes on his arm and down this arm, and he had medals all across here. And he was just such a great commander, we thought. And he caught everybody at everything because he had been in the Navy. I think he'd been in the Navy 30 years at that point. He was on his way out. Mm. And was it hard? Oh, it was fun. I don't know how hard it could have been. I was 18. I turned 18 in the Navy. I went in on September 5th, and on September 15th, I turned 18. Mm. I had joined the uh, early enlistment program. I enlisted in April. And then you go in after you graduate high school. So I went in after Pow Wow that year, 1972. And what was your job assignment? In boot camp or in the Navy? In the Navy. In the Navy, I was started off as photographic intelligence. <clears throat> and that was uh, identify, identifying ships and airplanes and the photographs that came back on the reconnaissance planes. And then I got elevated to third class seaman. And they changed their rating to intelligence specialist for certain guys, and I met that criteria. And I was on the ship sighting team on an aircraft carrier. And where exactly did you go? I went to Norfolk, Virginia. From Bo First, I went to nips Drafac, which stands for Naval Intelligence Processing Training Facility down in Albany, Georgia. And they trained us in intelligence interpretation and intelligence school. There was also the Flint River where they trained us on. That was fun. And then I went to the USS America based out of Norfolk, Virginia, but at the time was in the dry docks in Portsmouth, Virginia. And I was intelligence specialist. Hmm. And do you remember arriving 
on your first assignment on your ship, and Ooh. what was it like? Um, I got to the got off the plane, took a taxi to the base, to the Portsmouth base, walked through the gate, gave my papers, and they said, where's my ship? And I saw all these masts, and it was the biggest ships I had at that time, never seen real Navy ships. And I said, is that my ship? Is that my ship? And said, no, go all the way down. And I got down, and it was this huge thing with, they didn't have planes on it, it was in dry dock, but it had a trucks on it and cranes on it, huge cranes, and they were welding it, and it was just amazing. And I met Nat Lyles, who I had gone to intelligence school with, and he met me at the gangplank. They called up to intelligence, and they came and got me, and he took me to this labyrinthine, uh, all the decks and everything to get to my bunk, which was at that time, since I was a new seaman, was in the back, back, back of the ship next to where they kept the ammunition. And that's where I started in Portsmouth in the dry dock. And it, I had took, uh, it was just amazing because until that time I had never been on a ship. It was everything I dreamed it would be and more. Science fiction come to life. You know I mean? Tell me about tell me uh, about a couple of your most memorable experiences. Mm -hmm. Memorable experiences would be when we first took off on the ship, going through Roosevelt. Uh, was it Roosevelt Roads? Yeah, I think that's what they called it. Going out of Virginia, going from Portsmouth to Norfolk to Pier Twelve, I think it was where our ship was based. And it was the first time I was out at, on the ship. And that was a big thing. And the second one was when we left from Pier 12 to go on sea trials. And sea trials is where they test everything that they did to the ship. It had just got back from Vietnam, refitted, repaired. And it was the last of the Kennedy-class boats. That was the last conventional-powered ship. But it was still one of the big... It was considered a super carrier. So when we went out to sea. I woke up. And the thing that I remember, I was seasick. For just a little tiny bit. I couldn't because I was disoriented because the room was moving. And we hadn't got to sea yet. But even a ship that size going through Chesapeake Bay, you feel it moving. So once I got outside, I said, just go outside and find the front of the ship. I went outside, found the front of the ship, the back, and I never got seasick or felt queasy ever again. So that was pretty interesting. The other one was when we got down the Roosevelt Roads, off the uh, which was in the Caribbean, off Puerto Rico. St. Vincent with the island they used to bomb. The Puerto Rico on it, they protested. Oh, I forgot what it was called. I forgot what it was called. But anyway, um, it was during September and October, so it was the hurricane season. So it was really big waves down there. And it was just the, the power of that ship going through the waves and the rocking of it. And the ship is, is hinged, so you can see the front end. If you see down the hallway of a of a aircraft carrier, you actually see the ship twist. And that was pretty amazing. Other than that, I was up on the, I got to be on the uh, island of the ship on deck 13, which is pretty high, right around the, where the uh, captain was, uh, where the air ops was. So I got to be around there and see all the flight plans, flight operations. I got to see the planes fly on. And then because I was up there, I got to see flight operations pretty much any time I wanted because it was considered being on watch up there and nobody wanted to do it, but I did. So it was just, I just thought it was fun being at sea. And the other last one was, uh, when we went across the Atlantic the first time, it was also during, after the Roosevelt Roads, we went across the North Atlantic, and the waves was like 30 feet high. It was great. And I saw an albatross fly. Were you awarded any medals or citations? Nah. We got a... I was in OZ division. We got a uh, unit citation, because we had the most amount of good-sided ships. And that was partly due to me, actually. And how did you stay in touch with your family? Uh, one of my friends, husband, my sister's friend's husband, Arthur Nation, had a, was a ham radio operator. So this was before cell phones and everything. And every once in a while, we'd be able to patch through with a ham op operator and... Uh, call through that and then when you got ashore they had banks of telephones you could make telephone calls and other than writing that was it <coughs> excuse me <laughs> it's all right what was the food like food on an aircraft carrier was excellent excellent um the there were you could eat pretty much 24 hours a day 
when they didn't have regular uh, dinner hours, there was also snack hours for every watch because you there was a twenty four hour watch. So you pretty much ate all every every day. Um, this is at sea and even in uh, in port. And I think they had four, either two or four. I can't remember. They had a bunch of uh, lunch rooms for the enlisted. And then they also had a snack bar, a snack time for the enlisted. But I like breakfast best of all. And they also make really good cakes. <laughs> Did you ever feel pressure or stress? Um, only when we had general quarters. And when we went through the Suez Canal after they, was well, 1973 Israeli war, we were picking up the uh, minesweepers, the helicopter minesweepers. It was a little tense then. And I think during the uh, 73 conflict with Israel and Palestine, or was it, and who the, what's his name, the guy with the check and the, the one that died, what's his name, not Sadat. Benghazi? No, 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 I'll think of his name. Anyway, yeah, um, no, not really, not a lot, no. I was a good sailor, so I didn't have to worry about a lot. I just did my job and I liked it, so... Was there something you did specially for good luck? Nope. And how did people entertain themselves? <laughs> well, we were on a ship and we were sailors. <laughs> so there were movies. Pretty much every night there was a movie. Um, I got into music with a bunch of guys from the unit. So they always played guitars and had bands. Uh, they had casino night at sea. They had barbecues at sea on the flight deck. Uh, they had skeet shooting. I thought just being out at sea and being on the island was good, watching being outside all the time out of the ocean. I read a lot of books. Um, stereos were a big thing then, only records and cassettes. So everybody had a hi-fi, a really good stereo system from being overseas. And we listened to a lot of music. I went to the ship had a library, so I went and spent a lot of time in the library. And you could rent, uh, not rent, but you could take out uh, records at that time and tapes. And they had tapes and record players. You put a headphones on, you go in there and listen to the music. And they had books all the time, a lot of books. So I was happy. Did you ever have any entertainers from the USO or anything like that? Yes, the USO came. And the Miss America always came every year because we were the USS America. So Miss America came to tour. And the US tours, USO tours are really good. And I was in band, so every year, once in a while, they'd have band night with the... Uh, Different bands all on the carrier. Bluegrass, the ship's band, the fleet band would play. And they had big dances and casino night. And that was fun. So, yeah. Hmm. And movies. Again, lots of movies down in the, uh, on the uh, hangar deck. And y your own unit had movies. So you could either stay in your unit and watch a movie. Or if you didn't like what was playing there, you'd go down to the uh, different lounges. They had different uh, enlisted lounges all over. And you'd go to the lounge and see what movie was playing in there. So the ship was div divided into like units. Um, every you said units. Every Excuse unit me. had. So oh yes, yeah. every division. It did, there were different divisions on the ship, like a CIC, Command Intelligence Center, uh, Information Center. They had their own. It was whatever division they were. We were OZ division, which was the intelligence division, Deck Three. Hmm. And what did you do when you went on leave? Um, usually I came home, or I just went to uh, different cities and did the tourist thing. I wasn't really into the strip clubs and all the stuff that sailors do, but I did go to a couple of... We had a band, so we when we were overseas, we were always in a... Usually got a, a listed men's club, got to play in the band at the listed men's club. I didn't get in a lot of trouble. I bought a lot of stuff over... Uh, I toured a lot, went to castles, went to... Uh, Restaurants, typical sailor stuff. And what cities were these? Were Ooh, well, uh, let's see, Virginia, and then we were in Jacksonville, we were in Fort Lauderdale. We actually went to Havana, um, Cuba. Um, what's the base down there? What's the base where they keep the prisoners? Guantanamo. Went to Guantanamo Bay, which had a big, was a big base, and they had a great enlisted men's club, great bands. And swam in the Caribbean. When I went to overseas, I went to... Uh, Italy, France, England, Turkey, Spain, um, some of the, most of the Mediterranean, Greece, the Greek islands, the Spanish islands, a couple of the English islands, 
Um, I didn't get off when we went to the Middle East. I forget what country we went to, but I didn't even get off the ship. I like being on a ship. Um, cities we went to, uh, Marseille and Toulon and London and Barcelona and Valencia, uh, Athens, most of the big ones we went to. Uh, took a train to Madrid. That's pretty much it. <clears throat> Do you recall any humorous or unusual events while you were in the service, either abroad or stateside? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> They would shave cream your pillow <laughs> if you was if you messed up or just a new guy. They'd put a can of shaving cream and fill up your pillow with shaving cream. <laughs> that was a big one. Short sheet your bed. Um, the old guys would say, "Go down and get a go down to the engineering and ask for a, a twenty feet of chow line." So you go down and ask for chow line. They would call up and tell them, yeah, send them somewhere else. So they send you all over the ship. You get to know the ship. You get lost sooner or later. That was a big joke with the, they played on all the new guys. And, um, no, we just had a lot of fun. We were basically, you know, young guys. I was under 21. I was turned 18. So I was 18, 19, 20, 20, yeah, 20, 21 when I was in the Navy. So I was pretty young and stupid. Um... It was most of it was all fun. We was always telling jokes and messing around. You know, with a bunch of young guys that got paid and had a ship to play on. Do you have photographs? Yes, I do. And who are the people that you took photographs of? Oh, guys in my intelligence division mostly. My best friend uh, Richie Mendoza, uh, Nate Lyles, Nat Lyles. A uh, guy from North Carolina who was from North Carolina, and then he was a black guy from North Carolina, and then there was a white guy from North Carolina, Andy Womack, who was one of my good friends, Jerry Cruzman, John Fairchild, Ralph, uh, Maggio, what was Ralph's name? Lankford. Yeah, I had a bunch of good friends. It was a bunch of good guys. And did you keep a personal diary? No. <laughs> <laughs> Do you recall the day your service ended? Um, actually, I was in reserves for two years, but my active service, I flew off the carrier and went to Spain because we were in the Mediterranean, I think, and waited there and rode to Spain for a day, and then I flew across the United States. You flew across back home, and I ended in the Philadelphia shipyards and just waited to be processed there for about, I think it was a week. I think it was a week, and then uh, it ended, and that was it. And <clears throat> what did you do in the days and weeks after? Got myself a job. Shoot. Um, got used to being back home and pretty much started working. I got a couple of interviewed for some jobs, and then I got a job at uh, Peter Glenn and Buick Cadillac through my uncle, uh, Reginald Gardner, Pucci, and I was the prep, prep guy for the cars. Cleaned the cars, prepped them for sale, redid the new cars, uh, processed the new cars. Transported cars for the boss, transported the old boss up to his, uh, uh, what is it, would you do your kidneys? What is it, dialysis? And uh, I had a good time. I was a parts runner and a prep guy. And did you have your any of your education, um, was it supported by the GI Bill? I went and got my first degree through the GI Bill at Stony Brook University. Actually, I studied theater after a while because it was pretty easy and a lot of girls. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yes, the GI Bill helped me uh, pay my rent going to school for my first four years. Wonderful thing. And <clears throat> your close friends that you made in the service, do you continue any of those relationships? The only friend that I have from the service that has answered me that I went and visited recently was Richie Mendoza, my uh, good friend on the ship who lives in Texas, San Antonio. And I rode my motorcycle down and saw him from New York, down and spent a week with him and his lovely wife, Rosemary, down in Texas. And it was just like we were teenagers again. In fact, that's what his wife said. You guys talk like you never left each other. And we did. We had stupid. We were stupid. <laughs> 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 
And what did you go on to do as a career after the war? After the service? service? After the service, first I danced for like about 18 years, studied dance in New York City, got scholarships, went to college, didn't graduate at first. I left in Earl, left me without graduating after four years and um, danced in the city for about eight years, taught dance. And then I went back, uh, wrote my own program and got my degree and got a, uh, they got a award, student something award for being a dedicated student because I rode my bicycle back and forth to Stony Brook from Southampton or took the train and I wrote, started, helped start the dance program there, uh, Stony Brook Dance Ensemble. So, and then I went back and got my social work degree and then I went back again and got a writing degree. Okay, and how did your service and your experience affect your life? It gave me the discipline. It gave me, mostly I, I think it gave me the discipline and the self-assurance that I need to do anything. That had been an intelligence and having grown up in Southampton was told, you know, you get the feeling because you're from the reservation that you're not quite good enough or that they tracked you into classes like shop class and just the dummy classes. So getting into the Navy, I was recommended for O officer training um, to be a warrant officer, which I didn't do. And I was recruited by the Defense, and Agency, Defense Intelligence Agency, and also the FBI came and talked to us. And they, the Defense and Ag Intelligence Agency at that time was dealing with black, black market uh, heroin and hashish. So they were looking for minority guys. But my question was, do I get to carry a gun? Yes. Okay. And the second question was, do I have to wear a necktie? And they said, yes. And I said, okay, that's it for me. No. Um, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> Your service. How did the experience... Oh, so it gave me the discipline. Life. And it just gave me discipline. And it, it, I think it serves as a... For especially young people, it gives you a little bit of guidance where you're at that age where you're in your 20s and teens and you could lack to get in trouble because your impulse is... Uh, not really formed. So it gives you that base. It gives you that chance to mature. It gives you that job where you get a job where you're handling millions of dollars of equipment and responsibility. Uh, I was always given the responsibility of taking the guys out of the brig from our unit, our division, and taking them with me on my uh, various duties up on the bridge and the siding team because they figured it was tough duty, but the guys actually had a lot of fun. And... Uh, I think it just taught me that, you know, some things go your way and some things don't. And if you do the right thing, you'll be always taken care of. I never went to captain's mast. I did get uh, in trouble because I had a little insubordination, which is totally usual for an 18, 19-year-old. But I never had any strike against my record. So I just learned that um, I like my job, photographic intelligence and intelligence uh, processing and also interpretation. So I, was, I became good at it, and it led to other things where I was, uh, I still to this very day, 40 years later, work on maps and cartography. I studied it in college, and I studied it on my own, so it's been that basis for me, got me interested in maps and photography. Hmm. Very good. Have you attended any reunions? Did they have any? I have not attended a reunion. I would love to attend a reunion. Uh, they sunk my ship in the 1990s, I think, or 2000s, off the Grand Banks. And there's a USS America Association that I keep tabs on, but I haven't seen anybody from my unit that I would know. And I haven't been to any reunion. Uh, I tried to contact all the guys when I went down and visited Richie Mendoza back in 2010. And he's the only one that really answered, so he's the one that I kept in contact with to this very day. Is there anything you would like to add that we have not covered in this interview? I think that um, for the uh, for the record, I think that a, the military is a good choice for young people. Except you know, in times of war, there's always something, but that doesn't mean that you're going to get hurt necessarily, that you can get hurt just being in a gang war at home or riding. I think for a lot of young men nowadays, especially on where I live on the reservation, they're missing out on that maturation, that chance to mature and get away from home and learn what the big world is about. 
and see other places and, and visit other people, meet other people and learn how to work in the world that there this isn't all there is. So for me, in my formative years, in the teen years, which I think are very important, like I said, it gave me um, self-assurance and let me know that I had a brain, I had intelligence. It let me know that I could make my way in the world. And I think it was, I, it's an experience that I still live with to this very day. Uh, a lot of guys you see have spent four years, whether they're in the war or whatever, but their service is a big, important part of their life because it was when you were forming to be an adult. So no matter whether you stay in four years, six years, I had four and then six on reserve where I was doing things. It, it, t it dovetails with other things. It leads to other things, and it does help. Uh, it helped me a lot. I just loved it. And I always wonder if I stayed in what would have happened or if I went to the o uh, was it OCS. Yeah, OCS, uh, what would have happened. But that's the water under the bridge. I think I had a wonderful time. I thought it was a wonderful thing. I got to be at sea. Um, I got to cross the ocean. I got to see wonderful, just things that you don't get to see every day here on the island. So it was, overall, I thought it was a wonderful experience for me. And I'm very proud to have served my country. Mm, thank you. The end. <laughs>